Hello and welcome to the Meditation Conversation, the podcast to support your spiritual revolution. I'm your host, Kara Goodwin, and today I'm so excited to be joined by Nicole Angelique Kerr. Nicole is an award-winning health and wellness expert and national best-selling author of You Are Deathless, a near-death experience taught me how to fully live and not fear death. Throughout her 30-year career, she is focused on supporting thousands of people from every walk of life to make realistic, meaningful choices for lifelong health. As a 19-year-old cadet in the U.S. Air Force Academy, Nicole went through a transformative NDE. Her pursuit of improving her own health led her to inspire others to reach the overlooked domains of emotional, energetic, and spiritual well-being. So welcome, Nicole. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thank you, Kara, for inviting me. I am just delighted and excited and just so grateful to be on your show. Oh, wonderful. The feeling is mutual. These are really one of my one of my favorite topics because it's this sneak peek. We all end up on the other side of the curtain of death. And I think that there is so much healing when we hear from those who have gone through that curtain and come back. So would you mind starting by just sharing your NDE experience with us? No, I'd be happy to. I was a cadet, as you mentioned, at the United States Air Force Academy. Now, you have to understand, growing up, I modeled, I took ballet. I did not play with little army men. I was not a military type kid. And so I only went there to please my father. I am a recovering people pleaser. So I need to just, I need to just get that out there. Okay. Yes. So many of us are. (laughs) Yes. So this is what happens when you follow your parents and think that they know what's best for you all the time. And so I was one of the first classes of women out of the academy and it was really tough for me. And I knew within three weeks of basic training that I was on the wrong planet, so to speak. And wow. my soul was in the wrong place because it wasn't, I, most, our souls are not designed to kill people. And I appreciate what the military does in terms of protect and defend, but also I can see how every single person that has seen the theater or combat comes back and a piece of their soul is fragmented because that is not who we are by nature. Have to learn those skills and use them. It is Uh, It takes a certain personality and a certain type, and I'm just not that type. And so I couldn't quit. I could not say I'm done. I had, it took so long to get admitted to the academy. It was such an honor. I couldn't displease my father. He was a graduate and he was a Marine and he was like, my daughter's a cadet. He was so proud of me. And I finally became his girl. There's four kids, but I wanted to be his girl. And so I suffered through it, the, all the different mental, physical, emotional, and sexual abuse that goes on. And I just, you know, you just learn to compartmentalize and you learn to not have feelings. It's either yes or no, sir, no, sir, no excuse, sir. So starting my second year, I was getting, it gets harder academically. And I'm in, in classes like engineering where I have no business. My brain does not operate. I barely got out of organic chemistry, okay? That was with a D. I don't understand that, those sciences. Give me the biological sciences, geological, and I'm good. So the near-death, act, the near-death experience for me came when we were starting off the new year, my second, my second year there. And we were at a softball game. The Air Force had beer there. And I was getting a ride back with a fellow cadet. We were the last to leave. He had a Corvette convertible. He was a senior. So I did not date my entire high school life. In fact, my whole life, I had never been on a date. And now I'm out here with 4,000 guys, okay? So my dad's rules were no smoking, no drinking, and no dating upper cadet. This guy had been drinking, and I knew that, but I thought, okay, I'm going to have some fun. But he wanted to stop on the way back and have a couple more beers. And then he wanted to stop and watch the sunset. And then ding, it dawned on me. He had a whole different agenda. 
then to get back to the academy on time, which was really important. So when we pulled off to watch the sunset, that's when he started advancing sexually towards me. And I said, no, we got to get back. So he got back on the road. And the last thing I remember was getting back on the road. And then I woke up in the ICU at Penrose Community Hospital. So for 19 years, Carol, I did not remember that gap. And then it came to me when I was working at the Centers for Disease Control. I was at Starbucks. And all of a sudden, I got my car and I saw exactly how I was sitting in the Corvette. I saw exactly what happened. And I went directly to my chiropractor, who was a work, a body worker. And he helped me. He said, Nicole, what's happening is it's a repressed memory and it's coming up now. And I'm like, 19 years later? Wow. How does that happen? And I had asked my surgeon, because I was in the hospital for four months. I was pronounced dead at the scene. So that gets to the NDE experience is when the volunteer fire department showed up, one of my angels. Now, angels come in many forms, but this was a team that was in the physical form. My EMT that took a look at me, pulled the blanket. They had already, some bystanders already tried to get me back to life, couldn't put a blanket over me. So I was dead approximately 10 to 13 minutes. And so... They, he uncovered me and the only sign of life he could get was what they call a sternal knuckle press. And that is designed to elicit pain. And the pain, the only sign of life he could get was my right eye flickered and my right eye, the pupil in it dilated. So he knew I was alive. And what do we say about the soul and eyes? What's the common expression we hear? The, the window of windows of the soul. Yes. Yeah. So at that moment, my soul, which had left me earlier when I went flying through the windshield, that soul came back through that eye. And then he was able to get a blood pressure on me of 60 over zero, which is basically dead, and put some mass pants on me, which are these pants that he had never used that push all the blood up to your organs and did CPR me the whole way to the nearest hospital, which was a community hospital, not a trauma hospital. I happened to have, that was when the doctors were on call back then, and it was a Sunday night, and I had the first woman surgeon in Colorado Springs who was on call, and she her specialty was thoracic surgery. And she put together a team of nine different specialists over the four months I was there, and we were just like this. It, I detail it in the book. And when my memory came, exactly what happened. But it was, um, it took that 19 years for me to remember. And my body, he helped guide me, my chiropractor did, through what was happening. And then when I got up in the air, I was like, oh my God. And I knew I wasn't going to make it. When I fell down, I was going to die. And that's exactly what happened. So what I remembered was in the book, I called it Casper the Ghost, and I knew it was male. And I couldn't, I just couldn't remember any other details on that until this past August, after my book was published, my, in a meditation, my grandfather on my dad's side came to me. He was the one that saved me. And he was 58 years old when he died. And he died the end of August, massive heart attack. And I turned 58. And he told me it was time that I knew it was him that saved me. And he came down in an angelic form, lifted me up. And on the other side, I, I was not in this physical form. I could see my body in a ditch, all mangled, and they're all working on me. And I, could hear. And it's not that they were talking in English, but there were other spirits, other angels present where I was. And one of the discussions, which was one of the messages that I was told to give people is remember to ask the angelic realm for, they are all there on the other side, waiting for us to ask for help. But because we have free will in our society, they're not going to just interfere in our life. So please, ask for help and not wait till a crisis in your life to try 
to establish that and pray for, oh, oh, make this person well or whatever. It's about a relationship with that realm. And we have to start becoming aware that we are 80% spiritual and 20% physical. And we need to start spending more time in that part of our life, developing that relationship with what is our concept of God? What is our relationship with the angelic realm? Because they are there. This is not my imagination or other people's imagination. And angels come in many forms. It's not just uh, people being angels or the angels that you hear about and see they're there too, but there's many forms and they all have different functions, maybe is the best way to say that. Some help with communication, some help with protection. So the different archangels all have their specialty. Gabriel mm -hmm. is communication. Raphael is help and things like that. That is really important. And people say, how do I even do that? I said, before you go to sleep, just ask the angels for help with whatever you want and tell them to provide you some evidence that they heard you. And they will. You just have to be open to what that may look like. But just try it. And so you have nothing to lose and they will answer you. And the other message that I got was that I was told not to be afraid of death. That was going to be my mission to tell people that. And I was like, oh my God, that's huge. Yes. <laughs> that's huge. Where do you even start with that? And then I realized I was going to go back down in that body and have to do it. And I was like, no, I do not want to go back in that body because going back in that body meant, first of all, I was banged up bad. I broke my pelvis. I amputated my left foot. I severed my right wrist. I had a horrific road burn. I was a mess. Okay. That hence for seven weeks in ICU, four months in the hospital, I had to learn to walk again. It was every day. It was life or death for me. Let me just put it that way. And my mother did come out and she stayed with me that whole time, but it truly was that level of intensity. And I coded, I had six major operations and I actually coded in two of them. And I didn't want to come back. And I have an angel that is with me now called Michael. And he fought really hard for me to stay here really hard because I just didn't want to live with the pain anymore. I was having physical pain. Yes, I had drugs, but there's still pain that breaks through the drugs. Emotional pain because my parents blamed me for breaking my dad's rules that I deserved what I got. They come from that type of mindset. And then I disappointed God as well. This is Baptist Lutheran. Wow. So that to me was the worst pain that I had disappointed my dad and therefore the love, the affection, the approval, all that had just gone down the drain that I could never make this up because he was always going to believe that it was my fault for getting in the car with the drunk guy. And I didn't know he was drunk and no experience with alcoholics. And he turned out to have been an alcoholic. And so it was, and spiritually, I'd given up on God. I had given up on God in boot camp because I was doing stuff in boot camp. And I just was like, I can't believe I'm doing this. Just the abuse level and just praying that this certain person wouldn't come and do this to me or this person wouldn't. I had a captain in the next squadron who was hell bent on getting me out because he hated women at his academy. And he just thought I was, and I don't use this, but a dumb blonde kind of thing. And I was just like, no, my soul was just in the wrong place. And I couldn't, the shame and the failure and the guilt and the humiliation and embarrassment of quitting couldn't live with that. So unconsciously, my soul figured out the only way to get out of this is this car crash. And it's a high price to pay for doing this. But my entire life has changed because of this NDE. And especially remembering it, I have had a spiritual transformation. The God I was raised with, the vending machine concept where you put in the, the behaviors. And it's just, just not the Ten Commandments. There are other rules. Baptists can't dance. Every single church has their own set of rules. And mm -hmm. I think 
even God was confused. Of, what is this one saying? And what is that one saying? And then my dad had his own 10 commandments, which I talk about in the book. And the first one was, you're not spending the night with anybody because nothing good ever comes from a kid staying up all night. I did it once and got in trouble. And then I didn't have a room. I didn't sleep over again until I was at the Air Force Academy. So it was just a real suffocating. Yes, yes. And not being able to be supported to be your own being. And I think that's where my parents thought they knew better than any of us kids what we should do and how to do it and when to do it. And it was very strict where we were raised and we were raised in this of the Bible Belt. So that foundation is religion. And that is a very, when you're indoctrinated at a very young age with that concept, it is very hard to let that go because you are aligned and you're imprinted with fear from such a young age that right. you will be separated from your family. You'll go to hell if you do not do the right thing. And so on the other side, that was completely untrue. That is not who God is. It is a man-made belief system that is a total lie in order to keep people in fear, thus they can be controlled. And what I experienced was God is love. And in these lessons that I use in my book from the 10 common lessons of NDEs, I take that from a 2020 annual report from the International Association of Near-Death Studies, which is thousands of people that have had these studies. We all, they've come up with these 10 common themes. And the good news, Kara, is they're all positive. And that's what I really feel like my mission is now, is I'm an eternality advocate because eternality is a quality of state of being eternal, of having no end, your ceaselessness, and your soul has no end. That final breath, that moves on, goes back home, and you join the other soul realms where you came from. Yes, your physical body is going to decay. And if you ever go to a funeral and you actually see the dead body, you can look at it and it doesn't, I don't care how good the cosmetologist is, it just never looks like the person. It's just, that's not my aunt or that's not my grandmother. That's mm -hmm. just, they try to make it look like her, but it's not. And because she's missing her life and that's what keeps that energy body when you die, that's what splits and your soul goes back home. And it's beautiful. And I am trying to help people start coming to terms with you have to let these fears, and most of them are unconscious about dying, you have to resolve them. That is so powerful and so profound. Thank you for taking us through that. I have so many questions. First of all, what happened to the driver? He was a senior and his blood alcohol was double the level. And his dad was a three-star general and the Army Corps of Engineers. And I will tell you this, rank has his privilege. Any other cadet would have been kicked out of the academy. He was allowed to graduate and he was in the hospital a week. He had some back injuries, I believe, but he has never apologized to me. And I um, wrote him an angry letter from a therapist who had said, you need to write him an angry letter. She didn't tell me not to mail it. So I mailed it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And she couldn't believe I mailed it. And she's gone, oh, Nicole. And he wrote me back and he was still very angry and said he did apologize. And my roommates heard it. And my roommates were like, no, we never heard it. But, and the other part I would like to say is in the epilogue of my book, I just found out last May, I put a, I found out where my roommate, she quit the academy and I never knew where she went and either did the other two female roommates. So I found her on Facebook and we four got on a Zoom call. Now, this is 38 years later. And the first thing she said is, Nicole, I'm so sorry. I caused the crash. And I said, what? And she said, yeah, you asked me for a ride back. And I had told you yes earlier in the day. And then when it came time, you said, okay, I want to ride back with you. And she said, I'm going to take the senior cadet who's drunk, I'm going to drive his car back and I really like him and I really want to be alone with him. So there's one other car left over there. And I said, but he's been drinking. And she goes, I know they've all been drinking. And I said, I'm not so comfortable with that. And she said, oh, Nicole, go have fun. And she said, I'll see you back at the academy. And she never did. 
So she quit in December. She went home for Christmas break and never came back. And she felt that the guilt that she caused it, if she would have just given me that ride back, none of this would have happened. And she loved the Air Force. She did so well, but she failed a lot of the subjects that semester. She couldn't live. She's haunted to, by this day to the fact of what happened. And I said, you know, I never remember that part. And I said, I wish you would have said something to me. She goes, I thought you remembered and you were angry at me and never wanted to talk to me again. Oh, wow. So you can see how miscommunication can happen and you never resolve some issues. 38 years is better than none, but my God, my whole life would have been so much different if I would have known this because I have been blaming myself and worked really hard on that piece. And then when I told my dad what she had said, he said, well, you still made a bad decision and you should have walked back to the academy. And I have not talked to my dad since. That was a year ago and I cut off all contact with him and my mother. And I just said, I can't be around you. You're narcissistic and toxic and you will never forgive me for that decision. And, right. and it's so sad. It really is. But that's mm -hmm. his choice. And my choice is I can't be around people that are going to judge me and criticize me. And that's what they do. Yeah. Good for you. Good for yeah. you. But it's and hard. It's hard. I yeah. yeah. I think because you know, everything is family. Just There's that imprint. In the yes. Yes. There's such a big part of us. And so it takes a lot of courage, but it's it sounds very necessary. Oh, absol absolutely. And I'm my healing journey has advanced greatly not talking to them because mm -hmm. I it's kept pulling you back. Yeah. I kept hoping they change. And then when I heard him say that, I was like, no. And that yeah. shut the door. And it took that for right. me to shut the door because I kept trying and kept trying because I thought I fractured my family so bad with that accident that it was my responsibility to keep them all together and to be the one to pull Zoom calls together with the family and all this because everybody went their separate ways. And um now I'm not doing that anymore and I'm free of it. And it's, they live in Australia. I wish them the best. I can see them in spirit form now and who their spirit is. And I have to remember that and not their human form because the human form is toxic. Yeah. Good for you. So can you, can we dig a little bit deeper into what it was actually like in the NDE? So you've shared with us some of the lessons that you came back with. I'm really curious about what you saw, what you felt, what you, what it was like for you. I will tell you that being in that white light, it's a clear light. It's not a blinding light. It felt like you're just wrapped in angel wings. It felt so surreal. So there's no pain. There's no negativity. There's no suffering. It was pure love light and loving kindness on the other side, I would say. And it's just brilliant beyond words. It's really hard to put it into words. And it's that like you're an astronaut suspended in space. You're weightless and you're just filled with these streams of love and colors, colors of such intensity and colors we haven't, we can't even imagine on this side. And when I was, um, I did NET, which is neuroemotional technique. And I remember asking a little six-year-old who was in a fundamental church. She was scared that she was going to go to hell and be separated from her parents. And I said, what, what is your vision or what do you think or what is God to you? And she so eagerly told me, she just knew it. She said, well, he's a blue spirit and it's different colored balloons and he doesn't have a head but he talks. And I thought, okay, she has come the closest to anybody that I've heard talk about God because God is energy and God is love. And that's why God, there's nowhere God is not. Okay. And so it was such a beautiful expression. And I just thought, wow, I hope she never loses that. So that's the kind of beauty. It's not, there's no judgment. I think that is one of the biggest reliefs. You're not alone. You're, it was like, okay, that wasn't my grandfather. 
that came and got me. It took me a while to get that. And stuff still comes up after the book. It's still, oh, that's that part now. It, it's making sense now. And it was just, there's so many other books out there that have really described it, but we all come away with the same thing of the beauty, the light, the love, the benevolence of just this believable experience. And so that's why I wanted to reinforce that by just giving a short clip of my NDE and focus more on the lessons, because I think we're at a period in our humanity or existence where people really need to take responsibility for their spirituality. And that's going to look different for everyone, but they need to start looking at their concept of God because their concept of God relates to how they approach death or fear death. And so if you can come into death knowing how beautiful it is going to be and that you've done your work on yourself so you're not resistant to it, you know, it's going to make your passing, you see the bigger context of it, not, and it's not to negate that we're human and that we're going to feel pain and loss and suffering and all of that, but it's, it's the beings that have chosen to go back. We all come in here for a reason and for a lesson. And every single one of us has a different lesson to learn in terms of our soul's involvement. And so I needed to break away from those false belief systems that were being preached at the churches that I was attending and know that, okay, this is not some God in a vending machine that is, or judging me up in heaven and going to say you can come in or not come in. That just doesn't exist. I also want people to understand that everything and everyone is connected. But when you see your breath on a cold day, that's what leaves you, okay? That is vapor. That's energy, right? So we're all connected on the soul plane. We're all one. And so to start addressing how we are constantly looking at the differences between ourselves and start coming together and realizing we're all one. It's like in the military, you all bleed red, right? It's we're all one. And we need to start treating Mother Earth, our animals, and each other with more respect and more love and more humanity. So I know you don't want to go into the specifics about your NDE, but just to close the loop on the Michael piece with the angel yeah. Michael, was that Archangel Michael? No, Archangel Michael did come and see me. Yes. And then um, I have a what I would call a military angel. And I know that sounds like an oxymoron <laughs> named James, but he has been with me since day one of the military experience part of my life. And he is there to protect me. And he is the one, every time I've come up against a near-death experience, he has been there fighting for me. And he will call in resources as he needs them, like Archangel Michael, because the code blue was an emergency surgery. And they had actually told my parents, and they were in the chapel, that Nicole has passed away. It was all over code blue or one. And my dad, she, my mother said, my dad started crying and he's, where are we going to bury her? And mom said, I don't believe it. I don't believe she's dead. And then two minutes later, the surgical nurse comes in and said, her heart just started going again. It's just, it wasn't my time to leave. It's just, and what I fear so much is I need to control my life after the accident. When I didn't have any of that memory, I had a ferocious need to control. <laughs> really? Yes, because I was out of control in that car and look what happened to me. And, and I also, when my memory came back, realized why I had such an issue with men and dating and trust because I realized if I trusted a guy that uh, I could get hurt, I could get killed. So I didn't want to get them angry. So there again, the people pleasing. There are a lot of identities we all take on, whether it's the rebel or the people pleaser or whatever, that doesn't serve us after a while and actually causes illness in our life. Wow. You've alluded while we've talked during the course of our conversation about the role that angels are playing in your life now and since since your remembrances since your NDE since you started remembering 
I'm really curious about just what is your life like with your relationship with angels? Are they like present in a way that you see them, you hear them? Is it more of like in a meditative state or how is that for you? I hear them. So I'm clear audience. And I would say that for me, I do a regular check-in with myself every single morning saying, okay, what does my body, mind, and soul need today? And I will either muscle test or I can get it sometimes without saying, okay, I need to, because I have PTSD as well and migraines, what do I need to do to take care of myself on that level? And I'll get an answer. And then it's, okay, does my body need a walk today? Does it need a bath? Do I need to just be still? What does the body physical part need? And then what is there an emotion that I am not expressing? Did something happen yesterday and I shoved the emotion down and it wants to come back up and it, it, I need to express it? I thought, okay, I'm not going to deal with it. And that's the way I tended to do things is I don't want to hurt anybody. I don't want to express any negative emotions or anger or whatever. But no, there's appropriate ways to do that instead of swallowing it. And that's where I had learned from having an eating disorder. My parents didn't believe in mental health. So I developed an eating disorder almost a year to the day after my accident when my parents took me to Dallas to live with my sister. And so my mother, who had been, I'd been back to an infant state, gotten codependent with her. She leaves me and my dad leaves me with my sister, who is not equipped to take care of a traumatized person that hasn't gotten any mental health. So yeah, I might've been walking again and appearing to be physically okay, but I certainly wasn't okay mentally. And clearly not spiritually. I was still trying to follow that old path and go to all these different churches and nothing resonated with me. I just, it was like, no, God didn't listen to me. Jesus isn't my friend. They would have, what's the evidence? They didn't show up when I prayed or called or to them or whatever. It just, it didn't, it, that didn't work. So it caused me to have to go on this journey to find out what is my concept of God. And it's still evolving. And I think everybody is dealing with that. And if you choose to, it will continue to evolve for you in different ways. But what I can tell you is that God is not punitive, judgmental, or the wrath of God is not coming on you. That all elicits fear. And fear is not at all in the realm of God. And fear is a low vibration and it keeps you from having clarity, you lose your clarity when you're in fear because that prefrontal, prefrontal cortex, which is where your executive decision-making process happens, it gets hijacked by that amygdala, which goes into fight, flight, or fear, freeze. You know, when you get up against a trigger and you're like, I don't know how to deal with this. I just know I need to go get a pint of Ben and Jerry's and soothe myself. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. The clear audience did that come about when in that time when you were at your sister's or did that evolve? No, that's evolved since my memories come back. And oh, right. Yes. In 2019, you said, right? Was that uh, in 2019? I was 19 years old. So that would have been 2006, I think. So, yeah. Oh, when you, when you were, oh, it was 19 years later. Yes. Okay. So 2006 is when you started yeah. becoming clear. That was a big year for you because everything yeah. started coming in. Yes. Wow. It's really interesting because you've had this hairy experience and then it was like this desperate, like soul call, like got to get out of this at a soul level. But you really are like a warrior in many ways. You know what I mean? Yeah. Even though you didn't resonate with the military thing, but there is this like warrior-ness to you from a spiritual perspective. And I really honor like everything that you've been through because it's been like that. It's just, it's mind blowing what you've been through and what you've taken on in this life and on behalf of humanity and whoever you can reach, because it is such an important, it's so important for us to understand that we don't need to fear death. And that is such, I was just talking to a psychiatrist friend of mine last week, and we were talking about consciousness, and I was sharing some of the sort of multidimensional experiences that I personally have had, not near-death experiences, but 
way beyond the physical and experiencing myself as energy and things in life as energy and patterns and things like that. And he was kind of taking it to, gosh, how does that make you feel? Typical psychiatrist fashion. How does that make you feel? And, and then I would answer that. And he's like, yeah, but how does that make you feel? I'm like, what is it that you want me to say? And he's like, yeah, you're right. I'm leading you. But I really feel like this must put a different perspective of, with you. You have a different perspective oh. of death. And I was like, yes, actually, you're right. I do have a different perspective of death than before these things started happening. And he's, that is, I can't remember how he said it. In my mind, he said healing, but I'm sure that's not how he would have said it. But it was like, man, if we could imagine if people were walking around and they didn't fear death, because it's not like people are necessarily, it's in the forefront of their mind, but it's underneath so much of our beliefs yes. and our just the way that we behave and we live and we it's underneath a lot of our fears yes we're ultimately if you keep peeling the onion it's actually that we're afraid of our of dying and we don't want to talk about it yeah i was actually yeah. just the just uh, within the last few hours i was having coffee with a death doula and like, tell me everything about what this is. And we were just talking about this. So today is very much a death day for me because we were going deeply into how afraid humanity, especially in the West, is. It's not an integral part of our life, but it's right there. And we all know it's going to happen, but we don't want to believe it's going to happen to us. And we don't want to talk about it. And that certainly was me at 19 years old. I had, death was not on my mind. It was the furthest thing from my mind. But I, at 19, still had the concept of God that I was raised with. So I did die in fear. And that is another reason I think I came back is because I needed to redo, the, redo this experience and die in a state of grace, in a state of non-resistance and knowing what I'm going to now when my time comes. And I think in our society, almost every book written about death is cloaked in this veil of doom and gloom. And death has this cloud of depression and negativity throughout our culture and society. And we do, this is my mission, is to help change the world na narrative on it and the vibration and help people realize that it can happen at any age. It can happen any time, and that we need to prepare ourselves just like we prepare our taxes and everything else. You need to do your homework around this. And like my sister's husband passed away at 51 from ALS, and she had two children, 10 and 14. And of course, the children are like, Mommy, you're not going to die because they're scared. They're you're like, you're, and she's, no, I'm not going to die. And I'm just like, I don't know if I would tell them that because that's not exactly truth. You want them not to be afraid and worried, but you can't guarantee them that you're not going to have something happen to you. You need to be more honest and open and say, okay, I could die at any moment too. We all could. And if I do pass away, you're going to go live with your aunt and your uncle. And this is what's going to happen. And so that they're, instead of just in their mind trying to create a scenario of how they would deal with something, they actually know the truth of what would happen. Okay. And we don't control these things. And I think in America with every weekend or day, there seems to be a mass shooting. Truly that level of fear, especially with parents sending their kids to school, Sandy Hook, those little first graders thought, never thought they weren't yeah. going to come home. We live in a society right now that the fear is really have been heightened. And that's not good for any of our vibration or our soul because that is a low vibration. And we're trying to transcend that to a higher plane. Yeah, I think a lot of it, too. I love how you say preparing for it, because I think there's the physical prepare or the like intellectual preparing. Yes. But you said it so well in the beginning, too, about establishing a relationship with your team, your, yeah. your divinity. And so however that looks, because some people, they might feel more drawn to the angels. Some people may have more of their spirit guides. Yeah. Some people yeah. are more like extraterrestrials or their thing. And it, to me, it's yes, all of that. Yes. <laughs> yes. Awesome. yes. However, I'm not yes. telling you it has to look a certain way. But establishing that connection and working on that of strengthening that part of us so that 
because we have these connections unconsciously, yes. just as conscious awareness, it is just part of us. We can choose to nurture that and bring it into our conscious awareness so that it becomes more of our life experience where we we establish that connection, like you said, before we need it. And so then when we are riding the big waves of life and we are either in mental or emotional or physical trauma or in the throes of the hardest parts of life, we have that connection already. And it may be that we're facing death, our own death or somebody that we love, but we're, we've already done some groundwork so that we're not like, oh my God, death, what is that? And now am I gone forever? And, and it's, yeah. I've got to figure all this out because it's staring me in the face. Whereas we can approach it where it's more of a, and like you said, just continuing to build that connection, that awareness, that understanding before it's go time. And to get your toolbox of how are you going to deal with somebody that, you know, is passing? What do you do when you sit by their bed? What's the best thing that you can do for them? I think it's just hold their space and energy and be benevolent and not talking to them that they should be this or that or the other. Understand what type of music they liked or have a recording of their favorite songs, not your favorite songs to listen to. Things like that, that you can just be present for them and hold that and not have to do stuff uh, yeah. for them. And I think the other thing is understanding that death is, we are, we're not alone. I think so many people get scared of that, especially with COVID, that they weren't there when their loved one passed away. And what I realized is I passed away and nobody was near me. And it's more for the people that are still here in human form. I think that they want to be there. It makes them feel better and more connected. And that's the humanity part. But for the person that's transitioning, they are not alone. Their deceased loved ones, their animals, their the angels, their spirit guides, they're all starting to come in. And that's why you'll see them sometimes reaching out because they're going back and forth over the veil. And it's not the morphine doing that, okay? It really <laughs> is them having that experience. And so to allow it, because that's what they're reaching for is that presence, that light being. And really is, it's just beautiful. And I know it's a hard topic to talk about, but we need to start bringing it out into the open and looking at it from the positive aspects and to help us deal with a lot of, look at the veterans, 22 a day or suicidal, it's suicide, oh, gosh, and the number of in the number of kids today that are on dealing with and anxiety yeah. and depression and PTSD and trauma. And I will say this about trauma. If your parents have not healed their trauma, then they have not taught you that it's okay to heal yours. They're expecting, they just got over it, okay? And they didn't or need ignored it. it or yes, buried it. it. Yeah. yeah. If they did it and they're still functioning, you ought to be able to do it. And that's just not true. You have to heal these trauma wounds in order to get in alignment with who you really are as a spiritual being. And the other thing I think is this term called spiritual amnesia, where we have forgotten who we are at the source, which is light and this loving kindness. That is who our soul is. And every single one of us is that. And to please quit judging ourselves when we think we've done something wrong or a process has gone wrong. We judge our thoughts. We judge our actions, our emotions, that is just all bringing us down. Please don't judge yourself. We, we're the hardest on ourselves and it doesn't help anybody. And it certainly doesn't help our soul. Such, such an important point. Thank you so much. Nicole, this has been amazing. What a beautiful message that you have. And again, thank, thank you. you for your service. Uh <laughs> um, <laughs> A different tell, way to look at that. Exactly. Yeah. Tell us, tell everybody how they can reach you and or learn more about you and remind everybody about your book and where they can find it. Okay. My book is for those of you that are on the video, it's called You Are Deathless. And a near death experience taught me how to fully live and not fear death. And I don't know if you can see it, but that credential, I've 
several more, but the BTDT, I want to tell people that is been there, done that. And I encourage <laughs> every single one of you to put that on your resume. If you have been through something and you've come out the other side, experience trumps theory and classroom discussion every time. So that's, that's amazing. How, yeah. So I, I tell people because I've been through nutrition issues. I've been, that's the eating disorder, the colostomy, all these different things that I've had to deal with and really brings you more empathy, compassion, and sympathy when you have been there and done that. So I got it on a book. So that means you can put it on your resume too. And it is a real thing and it's a school of hard knocks so to speak. Oh, fantastic. But you can find that book on Amazon. It's on Barnes and Noble. It's in independent bookstores. They can order it for you, Kobo. And I'm on Facebook at Nicole.a.cur. I'm on Instagram, Nicole.angelique.cur. And I'm also on LinkedIn under Nicole Kerr. Those are the only three platforms I can keep up with since I'm yeah. doing this. But I will also let you know, it's going to be an audible version come spring. I just finished oh, recording the last chapter and I realized there's a segment of the population that prefers to, to listen that way. But in the book, I do have pictures. There's the car. Oh my God. And it's, yeah, a picture says it all. Right? Oh, wow. And I did make the front page of the paper, but not the way you would want. That was the Oh my goodness. It was bad. Yeah. And you can see why they all thought I was dead. But I stay in touch with my angels, my doctor, my paramedic, and my nurse. Oh, you do. And there's a whole section in the book called How did I see what I Calling All Angels. And I talk about going back to Colorado Springs and interviewing them in 2008, 25 years after the accident. Now you have to remember I never stood up, I was in a bed the whole time. And so the first thing they saw when they saw me coming was, oh my God, you're so tall because I'm five feet 11 and having oh my been, gosh. In, been in a bed for the entire time, they're like, you're so tall. <laughs> and they had never had uh, uh, a patient ever come back and thank them. Really? Yeah. Wow. So that's another thing is the gratitude. Please, people be grateful, even though that's their job or people whose job that is, you can never, we can never offer up enough gratitude. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you again so much. I have enjoyed this immense. Thank you again for everything and many blessings to you, Nicole. Thank you so much, Kara, and thank all of you out there.